Hello there, my name is Robin Norgren, and I'm your host for the podcast called Creativity Montessori and the Meaning of Life. Today I'd like to give you an excerpt from a book called White Hot Truth, Clarity for Keeping It Real on Your Spiritual Path from One Seeker to Another by Daniel Laporte. I was a bit out of breath, both the in and out breaths when I realized that I was at a jarring juncture, the conflict between sincere spiritual aspiration and the compulsion to improve. I was tired and still devoted to knowing more, always more, but mostly tired. One night I was meditating in the bathtub. I had begun my day already feeling a bit behind, quote, unquote, because I'd skip my sitting practice to sleep a few extra minutes before I woke my kid for school. I was learning to work with mantras, specifically for clearing obstacles. So, in the kitchen that morning, I cranked my mantra pay- playlist. Doesn't everyone have a morning mantra playlist? While I scrambled some eggs for my little dude. No breakfast for me, I was on a juice cleanse. Mom, that music is creepy. Can you put on some Bruno Mars? Eat your eggs. Once my boy was off to school, I had an early therapy session on the phone. Next, a meeting with my business lawyer, followed by an interview with a magazine editor who wanted wanted me to give their readers five easy tips for immediate enlightenment, like quickies that everyone can do, they said with a straight face. In between all of this, I text my besties about the rad insights I gleaned from my last therapy session. Me. Great shrink, I said to him, and I took the crumbs when they came, tired to make a cake out of them. Shrink said, crumbs keep you starving. Danielle says, not bad, not bad, not fed. Bam. Freaking crumbs, I say. Me, starving. She says, drop the mic. I say, makes me hungry. She says, me too. Back to my bathtub. The day ends and I'm soaking in my hot bath concoction of lavender, Himalayan pink salt, and apple cider vinegar. It's a classic brew to dispel and cleanse the negative energy. I was reflecting on forgiveness. I was breathing with light and I was begging my angels and any other on-duty deity to help lift my pain from me, specifically the anguish of my divorce. Please take it from me. I'm so tired of it coming around again and again. I'll do whatever I need to. I cried a good, heaving sobber of a cry. You know the kind. You go to the guttural sound that once the pain heaved out, you're at the bottom of the bowl of your being. It's sacred emptiness and, hey, look, what's waiting for you there? It's your joy all patient and steady. Joy smiles and nods to you. Good job. You got through it. It was one of those cries. As I got out of the bath, the steam rising off my skin, I recounted all that I'd done that day, that week. Heck, all that I've been doing for two decades to keep my soul in shape. I thought about what was written in my day planner, pick up protein powder, book cabin for writing retreat, There was more energy work appointments and yoga classes scheduled in. I wrote smiley faces next to the days where I actually made it to yoga class. And then I looked at myself in the bathroom mirror. I leaned forward and my eyes asked, but do you feel free? Because freedom was and is the whole point. Countless teachers of mysticism throughout time concur that the reason for spiritual endeavoring is liberation and only liberation. Liberation from fear, from restrictive ideologies, from illusion, from suffering. Liberation from the anxiety of not being one's true self. Free. Was I feeling it? Is everything that I was doing to be well and liberated really helping me to feel well and liberated? Because if liberation is a chore, then you aren't really free, are you? You can't seek approval on your way to sovereignty. Freedom is not something you need to earn. 
Joy does not come from a checklist. I've had to fight for my joy. I've also loved and laughed and created my way to it. But it's fair to say that crushing the obstacles, torching to the illusions, fielding the attacks, going down with the grief, it's been some strenuous work. I think of the places that I made myself go to become intimate with the dualities of love and expediency, light and darkness, confusion and clarity. I got through those portals the scrappy human way, the way mortals discover their connection to the cosmos, laughing really hard on the phone with girl, girlfriends, weeping alone on the kitchen floor. I did it with a home birth, divorce, building a career word by word, leaving it all on the stage, begging psychics for answers and pressing gurus for practicalities, praying daily for the light, to the light, with the light. At this point in my life, I am the joy that I fought for. Now that I'm here, very directly facing my soul, I wonder if all that hard self-help work was really a messed up way to go about finding illumination. Could I have just accepted myself much sooner and saved a lot of money on therapy? Maybe, but probably not. Truth is a journey. You have to love yourself into fullness. Here's an excerpt from a book called Steal Like an Artist by Austin Kleon. Quote, the only art I'll ever study is stuff that I can steal from, unquote, David Bowie. How to look at the world like an artist. Every artist gets asked the question, where do you get your ideas? The honest artist answers, I steal them. How does an artist look at the world? First, you figure out what's worth stealing. Then you move on to the next thing. That's about all there is to it. When you look at the world this way, you stop worrying about what's good and what's bad. There's only stuff worth stealing and stuff that's not worth stealing. Everything is up for grabs. If you don't find something worth stealing today, you might find it worth stealing tomorrow or a month or a year from now. Hear me. Nothing is original. The writer Jonathan Lethem has said that when people call something original, nine out of ten times they just don't know the references or the original sources involved. What a good artist understands is that nothing comes from nowhere. All creative work builds on what came before. Nothing is completely original. It's right there in the Bible. There is nothing new under the sun, Ecclesiastes 1.9. Some people find this idea depressing, but it fills me with, with hope. As the French writer André Guide put, everything that needs to be said has already been said, but since no one was listening, everything must be said again. If we're free from the burden of trying to be completely original, we can stop trying to make something out of nothing, and we can embrace influence instead of running away from it. The genealogy of ideas. Every new idea is just a mashup or a remix of one or more previous ideas. Here's a trick they teach you in art school. Draw two parallel lines on a piece of paper. How many lines are there? There's the first line, the second line, but then there's a line of negative space that runs between them. See it? One plus one equals three. A good example is genetics. You have a mother and you have a father. You possess features from both of them, but the sum of you is greater than their parts. You're a remix of your mom and dad and all of your ancestors. Just as you, as you have had familial genealogy, you also have a genealogy of ideas. You don't get to pick your family, but you can pick your teachers, and you can pick your friends, and you can pick the music you listen to, and you can pick the books you read, and you can pick the movies you see. 
You are, in fact, a mashup of what you choose to let into your life. You are the sum of your influences. The German writer Goeth said, We are shaped and fashioned by what we love. Jay-Z says, We were kids without fathers, so we found our fathers on wax and on the streets and in history. We got to pick and choose the ancestors who would inspire the world, and we were going to make them for ourselves. So um, this ad is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. From the book Montessori Learning in the 21st Century, A Guide for Parents and Teachers by M. Shannon Helfitch. When discussing independent movement and the need for it to be happening at all times, whenever possible, with children. For parents, the implications are that we must let our children be involved in the everyday tasks of life, whether washing vegetables for dinner, hanging up their own clothing, or setting the table. Children have a strong desire to contribute, even though they are not as efficient or as skilled in their movements as older children and adults. It is easy for an adult to convey messages of incompetence to a child who is doing the best he can and wants to participate. Adults are tempted to do things for children in order to save time and aggravation. But this does not ultimately help the child. In recent years, I have been working in China training Montessori teachers. And in China, Parents and grandparents take great pride in doting on their children or grandchildren. Unfortunately, this often results in the parents physically carrying their children, even at ages two or three, when children are fully capable of walking. I see parents feeding children who are capable of feeding themselves. I watched one four-year-old boy eat a slice of water melon and spit the seeds into his father's hand instead of spitting the seeds into the dish himself or removing the seeds from his mouth with his own fingers. Regarding parents overhelping their children with daily tasks, Dr. Montessori wrote, We, adults, believe that children are like puppets. We wash them and feed them as if they were dolls. We never stop to think that a child who does not act does not know how to act. But he should act, and nature has given him all the means for learning how to act. Such service is dangerous as well as easy. In close outlets, it closes outlets, places obstacles in the way of a life which is unfolding. And besides these immediate consequences, it has others which are more serious for the future. Thanks so much for stopping by. You can find me all over the web. All of my um, links are found on Instagram under at Robin underscore Norgren or at UBU for life. Mm-hmm.